<laughs> when did you know? That is the question that I am asking you and the question that we would ask Mary during this week where we contemplate and reflect upon the Magnificat. Hi, I'm Lace Watkins, Executive Director of the Lace on Race Center for Racial Equity, Chief Bottle Washer of the Lace on Race Cafe. And today we are going to be going into deeply, more deeply than we did before, the Magnificat and the meaning of the Manifesto of Mary. If you are new to us, welcome. If you like what you see, be sure to hit, click like and subscribe, click share on all platforms, Facebook, our own website, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as soon, wait for it, TikTok. If you'll notice, before I start something, something is new. I'm going to move this just a little bit so you can see what the various delinquents and my leadership team did for me. It is my very first Christmas tree of my adult life. It is really something. And I cried when I got it on Thursday. I brought it here yesterday and made a 30-minute video that didn't save. So we're doing this again, but with the tree extant. Here we go. I'm also pleased to be able to thank the Rory Beatty family for their beautiful and wonderful Christmas gift um, of this beautiful mug, which I will be sipping from over the next four or four or five videos. This is my official Christmas mug that I just got today at Christmas Eve. And so I am going to be drinking this and thinking about the goodness and the generosity of both Brenda and Walter. Cheers. So let's talk about the meat of the talk that we're going to be doing today. The question that people don't ask enough is when did Mary know? When did Mary know that this was not just any birth? When and why and how did Mary say yes? And then we're going to flip and pivot and leverage really fast because then we're going to be asking ourselves, when did we know? When did we know that we had a calling that only we could do, that there was a piece of the tapestry that only we could weave? That is not to say that the universe, if you want to say God or Ralph or the universe, couldn't do it without us. Let's not forget Esther, absolutely. The universe and God can do it without us, but that does not absolve us of our responsibility to do what we are called to do when we are called to do it, to not wait until we get comfortable or we feel that we're more proficient. Let's talk about this idea of who God calls first. Not the ones with credentials, not necessarily. Not the ones with a lot of letters. Mary had a lineage, sure, but she was on sort of the bottom of the food chain in terms of that lineage, as was her beloved Joseph. When she found out that she was going to be carrying a child, she did say yes, but she said yes with some caveats. Yes, I will carry this even though I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm going to do it on the down low. I'm not going to do it in a neighborhood where people can point and stare and talk about me at the water well. So she went to her distant cousin, Elizabeth. I can imagine this, and I'm going to ask you to use your fictive imagination as well and think about how Mary might have approached, might have approached the house of Elizabeth. This was not a triumphant ar ar arrival, not even a little bit. Mary was a scared teenage girl with a belly that was going to get bigger by the day where there was no one in her village raising their hand and claiming either her or that child. So she walked 
the distance, the far distance. I mean, was it a hundred miles? No, but a far distance if in, in, in terms of in terms of back then, then as far as you can walk. So I want you to think about the idea of Mary, young Mary, without anybody. Had she even told her own parents? Walking to distant cousins Elizabeth house, even if the distance was only five or ten miles. In San Diego, five or ten miles. Let's go outside and say 10 miles. 10 miles is, is the difference between my house outside Lemon Grove and Claremont. I know that there are things that I've done in Claremont that I want to keep on the down low. <laughs> but seriously, where people would not know her. That's a risk, though. That's a risk because you never know who you're going to see in your 10 mile radius. Literally 30 years ago, 30 years ago, when I was feeling my oats as a young woman in her early to mid 20s, I remember wearing a skirt that was perhaps too far above the knee for the tastes of my mother and her friends. I was with a bunch of friends at a brand new mall up in North County, not 10 miles away, but like 30 miles away from where my mom was. Thank God there was no such thing as cell phones back in 1984, 85. But when I got back home, there was a blinking on my answering machine. <laughs> it was my mom asking why I was wearing that skirt. And am I bringing dishonor to the family? How did she know? How did she know? Turns out one of her friends, Margaret, happened to be at North County Fair saw me, hightailed it to the nearest payphone and told my mom about a skirt that technically was modest. I mean, hi, still me. But I got in trouble for it at 22 or 23. You never know who you're going to find. Parenthetically, you know, never know who you're going to influence and who you're going to tell. But let's go back. Let's go back to, to her being there um, after five or 10 miles tired, thirsty, ashamed. Not ashamed, not ashamed of what was growing inside her. I do think that in the Christmas story, or if you prefer, the Christmas myth, I do believe that in the Christmas story that Mary did believe what she was told by the angel and later on, perhaps in a dream, that this was righteous, that her carrying the child to term was a righteous act, but she also knew that it was fraught, that it was risky, and that it was going to cost her sacrificially, that this was a big enough deal and was going to have enough ramifications that she needed to get out of Dodge. So here she is with this nebulous stuff floating through her head. Yeah, something's happening. I'm pretty sure God's a part of it. I'm pretty sure that I am fulfilling some sort of destiny. But I don't know what, and I didn't get the full memo. But I, I, I'm going on faith, but 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 it's, it's not fun, and I'm lonely, and I'm hungry, and I'm tired, and I'm scared. And I'm going to go to this cousin's house that I haven't seen in years. And God, I hope she opens the door. I hope she opens the door. I hope she's not too mean. I hope she doesn't make me sleep outside. I hope she doesn't send me away back to my family because I have a lot, a lot to answer for. I can imagine Mary coming up the driveway full of fear, full of trepidation, not knowing what was going to come next. I want to say a little bit of something about Saying yes with full throat, saying yes without reservation, saying yes without carve out or caveat. None of that means that you are going to be full of vim and vigor with absolutely no ambivalence, absolutely no fear, absolutely confident, almost to the point of arrogant, absolutely not. She said a full throated yes. Still didn't know why, but she said yes. She's still scared. 
still tired, still lonely. I think it's important that this story meant that Mary had to be on the move. Just like later on in the story, she was on the move. So we can book in this. We can book in with her, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to walk. To her traveling to Bethlehem with her engaged Joseph on the move. If we are called, very rarely can we stay static. And very rarely, when we are called or pressed into service, do we know the entire game plan. She didn't know the entire game plan when she was moving to Elizabeth, and she didn't know the entire game plan in Bethlehem. She certainly didn't know that she was going to be birthing this baby that's supposed to be such a big deal in a manger. So I'm thinking about all this, this whole week, this week when I thought it's like, oh, it's too late for me to do the Magnificat. But then Pastor Rebecca Little John, she did the Magnificat last Sunday. So I said, if she can, I can. But I, I and there's, there's, there's some things that, that Rebecca said that I'm going to be talking about later on. But I want to use my fictive imagination when I was thinking about this story, this myth earlier this week. And I um, rarely play pop music, but I did. I found myself on the pop music station in San Diego. And um, one after the other, I heard Adele. I knew it was Adele, didn't know the song, but I knew it was Adele. And then I heard Lizzo. And it just came together for me. I want us to remember for a minute, Mary, and I want you to imagine her as Lizzo, young, black, fat, everything that society chooses not to cherish. Coming up the driveway to her distant cousin, Adele. Adele, now thin and blonder than she's ever been. And she's hoping that maybe she'll get to hang out in the pool house in Brentwood or Bel Air, wherever Adele is staying. And Adele comes out, perfect hair, perfect nails, it, right in the middle of this like four, huge, huge mansion. And she sees Lizzo and she sings. She sings. Adele, Elizabeth, sings the song. Blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women. Can you imagine that like it, like right here in the present day where here Lizzo is at the bottom of this long driveway and Adele sees her and flings her arms open. Get up here. Get up here. Blessed are you. It is one thing. It's one thing for you to think maybe Maybe there's something special for me. Maybe there is a job that only I can do. But you don't quite know what, and you don't quite know how, and you don't quite know if you're equipped, and you, you actually are pretty damn sure that you're not equipped. On a personal note, I have rarely been equipped for the work that I have been called to do. Not equipped by the world's standards. Not equipped in terms of title. Not in, ter not in terms of degree. Not in terms of education. Very rarely have I had the resume that would have allowed me to do the work that I was called to do. Mary was the last person you would think would be changing history, but she was. But I want to keep the focus on Elizabeth. We're going to talk about Mary later on and Mary's manifesto. But, but for now, let's talk about Elizabeth. There are few gifts, there are few gifts more affirming than someone who sees your potential and gets behind you. I got you. This is what Adele is saying to Lizzo, what Elizabeth was saying to Mary. You will not walk alone in this. There's also something important to hear as we pivot as we pivot to race. I 
I don't think it's by accident that I was listening to 98.1 in San Diego in my Santa Fe, and I heard Lizzo and Adele. Adele is an interesting character. She has made her fortune off of doing good renditions in the R&B style. And we can have this conversation about appreciation versus appropriation. But she has given often credit where credit is due. She also has not, but she's young, she'll try. But what's important to note here is that she remembers the wellspring, the wellspring, the Genesis story, the history, the lineage that she has adopted. She doesn't forget that. And so she doesn't forget the continuity between herself and Lizzo. A few years ago, when basically it was all about Adele, all about Adele, it was the year of Adele at the Grammys and all the other awards, she made it a point, just like other artists like Bonnie Raitt, just like other artists like James Taylor, to say, yeah, grateful to be here. There are people on whose shoulders I stand. She has done some mentoring. She has made sure that people know that she is not acting as though she's cutting this out of whole cloth. So let's go back to our fictive imaginations and think about Lizzo and Adele. And Adele brings her up. Get in here. And then she pivots and she leverages. What do you need? And before Lizzo can open her mouth, cupboards are flung wide. I can imagine, if, if, if this were two, really 2,000 years ago, I can imagine her draping her in silk. These days, I'm imagining her anointing her with like the super pricey Joe Malone cologne, right? Um, it's British, so it's Adele. That's why I used it. I can imagine her going, oh, no, 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 no. I want you to have this amazing cloak. Well, cloak, you know, bomber jacket. It's all the same thing. No, you are not. You are not going to sit in my pool house. Here's the master bedroom. I'll sleep in this one right here. I'll make sure that you have coffee in the morning. And Adele's world for the next three months, like Elizabeth's world for the next three months, was about suckering and nurturing and building up and affirming the call that Mary Lizzo has. And then she did something amazing. She allowed herself to be a secondary character in Mary's story. That makes a big deal when it comes to race. Are you willing to acknowledge, flex, and pivot, and then step back? This is the Mary story. Mary, if we were talking about like the credits in a movie, Mary is a, what we call above the fold, above the title. Mary starring in... Mary's pregnancy featuring Elizabeth. Very few people want to do this, and I think it's worth talking about why. Why are people unwilling to become or to allow themselves or to acknowledge that they are not always going to be the Viola Davis or the Julia Roberts, that sometimes they are going to be secondary players that move the plot along, but whose names you may never know. You may never know. Have you ever like talked about someone who was like in all these movies, in a lot of movies, but their name is always on the tip of your tongue and you cannot for the life of you, but 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 they were they were in they were in Ocean's Eleven and then they were and, you're, you're, and you cannot, for the life of you, give the name. But you know that they brought value to the project that they were in. Elizabeth is rarely spoken about except as that, that initial ex, exclamation and exhortation. Blessed are you among women. But no one's really talking about, I mean, they move it along fast. Three months later, Mary leaves. But she didn't leave in shame, and she didn't leave in want. Elizabeth, Adele, 
Elizabeth had no problem becoming a secondary character. And much like the video that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Adele had no problem making room. No, you will not sleep in the pool house. You have the master bedroom. Here's my favorite robe. Here are my favorite slippers. What, what's your favorite tea? What's your favorite tea? I'll make sure that we have like five boxes of them. Saying yes first, saying it before it came out of Mary's mouth and giving more than Mary asked for or anticipated. And I want to ask whether or not you do this in your own racial justice walk. Do you give from first fruits or do you give out of your excess? In this story, both the imaginary mythical story from 2,000 years ago and, and what we're talking about here with, 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 with Adele and Lizzo, I cannot imagine that Adele rummaged around the bottom of her closet and found some ratty old sweatshirt and threw it at Lizzo. No, no. I have a friend of mine, Julie who knows how to give a gift. In fact, it's one of her love languages. And you know, even when she's giving you something that's like, this is, and when she says, this is my absolute favorite thing, like if she were here, this is my absolute favorite cop, here. And you know, she's telling the truth. You know, she's not giving you cast offs or hand me downs. This really is her favorite one. It, it's to the point where you're afraid to tell Julie that you like something because Julie would go, oh my gosh, you like it? You like these earrings? Here you go. I'll sanitize them for you, but they're your earrings now. Julie has no problem. Julie has no problem with doing just exactly that in her life, just like Lizzo did, just like Elizabeth did. Adele also did something else incredibly you know, I should have paused for that, but it, I did it on the first try. Adele did something else that was generous. Adele sent her on her way after three months, but she sent her away changed. That's a big deal. How do people leave your presence? How do people respond to your influence? Are you leaving them in a better place? than when you found them. That is a question worth pondering. Blessed are you among women. Do you treat everyone with whom you have an encounter as someone with a purpose, with a calling, with a destiny, with a responsibility, because if you did, there's no way you could fail to cherish that person. Elizabeth, Adele, saw that in Mary, Lizzo. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. And so if that's running through your head all the time with everyone you meet, blessed are you. You are going to give them your best. And you're going to keep saying it until the downtrodden and the shame-filled and the humiliated can look you in the eye and say, I know! Got to be careful with this. Not the, not the arrogant, I know. Put some stank on it. But I know. I am blessed among women. <laughs> For some, it is a revelation. For some, it's just a reminder of something they already knew. But yeah, I know. I am blessed. One of the greatest gifts that Elizabeth gave Mary, that, 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 that Adele gave Lizzo, was the ability to look eye to eye, to keep that chin raised. But eventually it was time for Mary to go and to meet her destiny. And the generosity of Elizabeth in saying, it's time for you to go. But again, but again, with her best. Let's go back 2,000 years. I, I, I can imagine that she got the best donkey with the best blankets to be able to 
be there for the, for the journey back home so it wouldn't hurt herself or her belly. Here in 2021, I can imagine that, you know, Adele gave Lizza her best Tesla and then completely blew the mileage by making sure that she had everything she needed. I'm going to give you everything in my pantry. Do you think, I, 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 here's that my favorite pair of shoes, my favorite pair of Uggs. You can have them. Okay, you might want to put some socks in there. My feet are bigger than yours. And, 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 and Lizzie was going, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need any more. No. Is there anything else you need? Well, well I, was, I was hoping that maybe I could have a couple, of, a couple of sandwiches. And the next thing you know, there's a picnic basket up to here right there on the passenger side. Lizzo will want for nothing. Lizzo will want for nothing. You do it fast. You do it first. And you do it more than you ask for, particularly for populations that historically have been oppressed and never cherished. There is something so different about a grudging gift where you're giving the minimum, where you're doing the minimum, and then giving more above and beyond, an almost embarrassment of riches. And now we get to talk about embarrassment. Three months later, three months later, Mary comes back to her hometown, whether on a donkey or in a Tesla. But she's not looking down. And by this time, Mary shows three months in. Mary's showing. There's no question. Mary's got a bun in the oven. But her eyes are not downcast, nor is she grandiose. If y'all only knew the baby I was carrying, y'all would treat me a lot better. No. Eye to eye. Assurance, not arrogance. Gratitude not grandiosity. And the lessons that she learned from her friend, her cousin, her sister. Not everybody needs to know the whole story because the story will unfold. But I will definitely out myself. Rebecca Littlejohn brought up something last Sunday that, that has stuck with me, that, that literally, I mean, I've read The Magnificat more than once, trust me. But here, here, here is something that I didn't think about. That whole idea of Mary coming back, showing, showing, outing herself. Now, back in the day, I'm old enough to remember girls who kind of, you know, just basically disappeared off the face of the earth the first semester of junior year. And then they're back with a flat belly and uh, <clears throat> an interestingly uh, surprising little sister. No one wanted to talk about it. And so basically now, 40 years later, there's all this shame. And then the next thing you know, they're on Maury Povich. My mother was really my sister. Well, actually, my sister was really my mother. But no, you don't need shame-based reality shows. If you're telling your truth and you're outing yourself, and before anyone can attempt to sabotage or derail the narrative, you are telling the truth the whole time. If you're not afraid, if you're not afraid, no one can call you out on basic cable. So we have to out ourselves. And in our racial justice journey, we have to out ourselves as people who are changed. There's no way that we can change the world outside there's no way that we can take it outside unless we ourselves are changed. That's a big deal. And it is something that I call you to. I am asking you to do more than you thought you could for the people that you encounter, for yourself, and for the people that you say you stand for and with. Challenging systems and institutions. And now we're going to get to that because we've talked about how blessed Mary was among women. And now we need to talk about Mary's response to Elizabeth. It's hot. 
it is a shot across the bow. And one of the major failings in telling the Christmas story or the Christmas myth is that we have defanged Mary's manifesto. But in the next video, she gets her teeth back. Stay tuned. I love you all again. If you liked this video, make sure that you are liking, subscribing, hearting, and sharing across all platforms. If you would like to support the work of Lace on Race and the Lace on Race Center for Racial Equity, uh, there will be a way to do that in the comments section. Feel free to message me or to me or to leave comments. One way to really support Lace on Race is to comment and um, the algorithms go crazy when you do. So I'm hoping for no fewer than 100 comments on this video. It will be both on the Lace on Race Facebook page. It will be here on YouTube. It will also um, be on our website in the Vistro and also at the website. I love you all. On this day before the fulfillment of the Christmas story or the Christmas myth, I wish you health and joy with family and friends. And I wish you that you truly can know and internalize. Blessed are you. It's resumed. I'm having a little bit of trouble closing this out. So I'm hoping that this sticks around. If you're still watching, thank you. Stay tuned for the Magnificat Part 2, Mary's Manifesto.